A lot of people think you make money when you sell the home. You're actually making money when you buy the home, right? You're, that's your cost basis. That's what affects your net operating income, your cash flow, uh, your cap rate, so to speak, everything, right? Welcome to the Accelerated Investor Podcast with Josh Cantwell. Josh Cantwell. If you love entrepreneurship and investing in real estate, then you are in the right place. Josh is the CEO of Freeland Ventures Real Estate Private Equity and has personally invested in well over 500 properties all across the country. He's also made hundreds of private lender loans and owns over 1,000 units of apartments. Josh is an expert at raising private money for deals, and he prides himself on never having had a boss in his entire adult life. Josh and his team also mentor investors and entrepreneurs from all over the world. He doesn't dream about doing deals. He actually does them, and so do his listeners and students. Now sit back, listen, listen learn, learn, and accelerate your business, your life, and your investing with the Accelerated Investor Podcast. So hey, welcome back to Accelerated Investor. I'm so excited to share with you again. So excited to be part of your journey provide value and opportunity and deals and joint venture opportunities to all of my listeners and students around the globe. I'm so excited to be back with you again. Today, we're talking with Christian Olin. He's the vice president of direct lending for a company called OnQ Financial. Uh, they're a retail lender, a direct lender, did over $50 million in lending volume in their very first year. And we're going to talk today with Christian about investors, about investor markets. We're going to talk about investor financing for for your rental portfolios and building your portfolio. We're also going to talk a little bit today about underwriting. I'm curious to hear his take on what's going on today with underwriting. Everybody thinks like, okay, we're, we're at the top of an economic cycle, maybe at the top of a housing boom. We're at the top of this, you know, this this 10, 12 year economic expansion. And I'm a firm believer that the end financing, businesses getting financing, real estate investors getting financing, you know, and buyers getting financing, that money in the system is what allows to, uh, the rest of the, the, the whole economy to either grow, expand, or contract. So I want to welcome Christian Olin to the podcast. Thanks very much for jumping on with me. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Really, uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time, inviting me on, and uh, looking forward to uh, to the knowledge that uh, that we can share with your listeners. I think it'll be great. Absolutely, yeah. And we got we, it's great because you're a listener of the podcast. Your team is a listener of the podcast. We submitted the inquiry. We connected through the podcast. I want to tell all of our listeners that we do have listeners that we connect with through this podcast that become guests, just like Christian. So if you have an interest in the podcast, you like it, and you have an amazing story to share, your entrepreneurial journey or a strategy that you'd like to talk to us about, you know, let us know. Let us know. And we'd love to have you on. So Christian, um, why don't you just give us, again, the 30-second, one-minute uh, kind of overview of you, your company, and a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, sure. So a little bit about uh, OnQ. We're, uh, we're a retail lender. We've got about 900 employees, 91 retail locations. My direct lending division does about, call it $50 million a month. OnQ as a whole, we'll do about $5 billion in loan volume this year. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're a bank. We've been in business since 2005. We weathered that first real estate storm. Uh, you know, the financial crisis, as, we, as some people like to call it. Uh, I call it a buying opportunity, but you know, right. six, six of one, half a dozen of another, right? Um, and uh, you know, and and we've got a couple things that uh, you know, our tagline is mortgage is simplified. We really do try and try and simplify the mortgage process for homeowners, investors, uh, multi-unit properties, things like that. Uh, my career started uh, on Wall Street. I was, uh, you know, an equities trader. Worked with Morgan Stanley, another private investment bank called Sands Brothers kind of, uh, found, that was in New York, found my way back to Arizona where I grew up and, uh, you know, started investing, took some of that money that I was able to walk away with, started investing in commercial properties and uh, then kind of found my way over to, uh, to OnQ. I was excited about the growth and, uh, and I kind of head up new divisions here. Obviously, my, my latest project is the direct lending division. Um, the entrepreneurial journey 
is always a bumpy one, right? It's yeah. not uh, it, it's not the journey for everyone, but guys like you and I that that love it, we love those bumps. We love those. We we view them as challenges, right? Not that, yeah. that's what we live and breathe to overcome, right? Without that, without those, our days would be boring, I believe. So that that's kind of the. The, the 30, 60 second version. Sure. Yeah. Appreciate that. So you guys track markets. Um, obviously you're lending in a lot of markets, lending across the country, 5 billion in loan volume. So you're looking at what markets are, are up, what markets are down, where there's population uh, movement, where there's uh, people moving into areas like Arizona and Texas, people moving out of areas like New York, Illinois, and California. Talk to me right now about you guys are lending all over the place. You're working with a lot of investors who are building portfolios. What are some markets that you're seeing where there's a lot of movement, a lot of activity, a lot of competition? What are some of the hottest markets right now that you guys like to lend on that your clients are having a lot of success in? Sure. Um, Arizona, as, as uh, you know, Arizona is super hot. Uh, we're headquartered out of here, so we know this market extremely well. We probably have the largest footprint here. Um, we've got 45,000 square feet of our corporate headquarters. So, so we really were anchored out of here. Uh, outside of Arizona, Nevada is hot. Texas is hot. Texas is one of those few markets that that never had the huge upswing, but never had the low downswing either. You know, a lot of that has to do with some of their regulations on refinancing and cash out and whatnot. But, uh, but it's a super, super hot market right now. Washington, Washington is insane. It's blowing up. They're busing people in, uh, and, uh, and, and basically, they're shipping 50 buyers into a home and the, the real estate brokers are standing out front and taking the offers. Um, so, Jeez. I mean, those are probably the hottest markets we're seeing right now. Uh, me, from a personal point of view, you know, I like to be a little more speculative. If you're going into the into the super hot markets, you're often, you know, sometimes you're buying at a higher cost basis, obviously. Sure. Yeah. As long as the properties, like, when I talk about recession, when I talk about, you know, economic, you know, again, top of top of a cycle, potentially mm -hmm. when, when, when the thing crashes, the good thing is four out of the last five recessions that we've had, the housing values actually went up. The only one that it didn't was in 2007, 2008, 2009. And so housing often is one of the factors that actually carries our economy through a recession, not necessarily as super negatively impacted by it. Right now, there's not enough inventory, right? Mm -hmm. There's not enough inventory. There's a lot of buyers looking to buy. There's obviously a lot of massive hedge funds that have bought tens of thousands of properties, taken them off the market, turning them into rentals. Um, and so for your investor clients who are buying, do you see any type of acquisition strategies or do you hear from them some of the maybe how are they creating a competitive advantage to buy properties or are they simply buying them, you know, at retail price or maybe a small discount and just cash flowing them and watching the appreciation happen? You know, I mean, I think it's a little of both. Um, when we kind of work with our investors, uh, you know, and, and obviously being licensed on the lending side, I have to be careful always what I advise them. But some of the strategies that that I've used in the past and that others, you know, that I, that I kind of preach to my friends, so to speak, is is one, pick an area, right? Learn that area. You know, I can use Arizona, for example. Uh, if you know Arcadia, you know Arcadia, right? If you're an outside investor coming in to buy in Arcadia, you don't really fully know, you know, what you're getting, what the right location is. I mean, a couple streets difference in a neighborhood like Arcadia can can change the cost of a home a couple hundred thousand dollars, literally. Um, so some of the strategies that I advise are really, you know, it, first of all, it's got to be your passion, right? So learn that neighborhood or learn a couple neighborhoods and then start knocking on doors. Drop mail on those neighborhoods. You're right. Something you said is there's a lot of there's a lot of huge hedge funds, private equity companies out there bringing in and purchasing 500, 2,500 homes in, in a specific price point. You don't want to compete with these guys, right? They're not your competition. So how do you take yourself out of that? You know, they'll, they'll bid up the price of the home and it doesn't matter if they pay 10 or 15,000 over to ask for it, right? But you can never change your cost basis on that home. A lot of people think you make money when you sell the home. You're actually making money when you buy the uh, home, right? You're, that's your cost basis. That's what affects your net operating income, your cash flow, uh, your cap rate, so to speak, everything, right? So I recommend that 
people start knocking on doors, they drop mail themselves, um, you know, a family mailer, a small investor mailer, hey, looking to purchase a home in your neighborhood. Um, you know, I'm not a huge company, I'm, I'm a single buyer, uh, you know, a picture of their family works really well on it if they have kids with their dog, you know, they're, somebody looking to sell their home is, is a lot more likely to call that than, you know, BlackRock Capital dropping, you know, a mailer on them. Get in front right. of that person, do six months before they're looking to sell, make sure you're the first person they're gonna call, they don't list the house, buying an off-market home, I mean, you can obviously meet in the middle in the very beginning, um, you know, because, because they don't have the real estate fee, so to speak. Right, right, exactly. I love it. Yeah, we tell our students and our listeners all the time, look, if the market's competitive, you've got to expand your market, which means mm -hmm. go out to further away markets, expand your market, not just in your direct backyard, but you might have to go an hour, two hours away from your backyard, expand yeah. your market or expand your marketing. And with so many people doing direct mail, so many people doing letters, I mean, we've just interviewed a number of other guests for the podcast. One of them was Steve Morris, who we just interviewed as one of our biggest borrowers and one of our biggest joint venture partners. And he's like, look, I don't spend any money anymore on just direct mailers or yellow letters, postcards. We've got to be different, right? So if I do do a, a mail campaign, we do a super niche mail campaign, it's got to be totally uh, different. You know, and he had talked about how he's got to differentiate or die. The one thing you mentioned, which is congruent with what we teach, which is congruent with some of our other podcasts is, you know, sort of that, I guess, more guerrilla on the ground marketing of door knocking, letters, door hangers, you know, driving for dollars. Again, expand your marketing because so many people want to automate the technology of marketing, which is great, but when everybody automates it, then all the marketing looks identical. So how exactly. do you differentiate yourself? Sometimes it's just, it, it's the physical work of going to a house, walking to a house, doing a, mm -hmm. uh, a door knocker or doing a, uh, a driving for dollars to find a deal. If you're going to buy that property and then finance it, which is Christian's expertise, is that fin long-term financing for your portfolios is you buy that asset one time, you hold on, it pays, pays you for the rest of your life. So you do the work one time and it pays you forever, which is fantastic. Um, so Christian, I'm, I'm interested to hear more about your thoughts on what's going on today with underwriting. With the market in its place where it is, a lot of people are, you know, they're, they're concerned. They think, you know, are we at the top of a market? Is there going to be a housing, uh, you know, bust? Is there going to be, is, is, is the balloon going to pop? What's going on? And I firmly believe it has a lot to do with the, the, the back end financing, the end buyer or the refinance lending. The looser it gets, the faster everything moves its way through the food chain. Right. The more they constrict the, the, the final buyer who's getting the financing, the more things back up in the food chain, things slow down. What's your kind of opinion? What are your thoughts on underwriting today, debt to income ratios, and how loose is it? Are we in subprime territory? Where are we at with underwriting? You know, I, I have a lot of people ask me, and always the first first thing that they ask me is, you know, are we going to have another bubble? Are we going to have another bust? Are, are the banks going to collapse, right? Um, you know, and I don't think anybody has a crystal crystal ball on that, so to speak, but I think there's a couple points, and I'll jump in on right in just a minute, but one of the main points that you can look at is a lot of the homes last time were bought on stated income or Nina products, no income, no asset, right? Um, you had people that financially weren't able to really buy five homes, but they were able to in that last real estate run that we had, right? So you don't have those products, right? Um, uh, will we see them come back to the market? We, we may, um, but uh, I mean, hopefully we would see them come back with more substantial down payments and, uh, and, and whatnot. So I, I think that when we look at, are we at the tops of the markets? I mean, in my neighborhood, yeah, homes are selling for, for, uh, you know, above what they were the, you know, in 2008. Right. Um, uh, but without those products, uh, I, I think it provides us some stability. Underwriting guidelines, um, they, they have obviously loosened up. I mean, if you were trying to borrow money in 2009, 2010, I mean, they were extremely, you know, constringent, right? I mean, it felt like you had a, you know, uh, you know, your hands were tied basically. Um, and you had to go out and look for hard money and other things, which actually still turned out to be a great investment, right? right. Um, but under underwriting guidelines, they have, they, they've loosened up a little bit. Um, so much so that, I, I mean, I know a lot of mortgage companies have a lot of friends in the business, you know, underwriting turn times have increased, right? Um, so I, I think that 
for the next 12 months, obviously, at least to the election, we're going to see a solid market. And, uh, and, and something that I always advise is whether you're buying a personal home, your first investor home, buy something in a neighborhood that you're comfortable with and that you want to hold on to, kind of like you said, for at least 10 years, right? Everybody's always worried, well, what, what if we have another crash? What if we have another crash? Well, guess what? If you bought the property right and you've got a renter in there and you can cover that note every month, that's irrelevant. It always yeah. comes back, right? You've got a tangible asset where as opposed to the stock market, right? Um, so I think we're going to see underwriting, underwriting guidelines probably loosen up even a little bit more in the next, uh, next 12 months. Um, especially from, from a retail standpoint, um, you know, we're always, you know, we're always weary on, on the cash outs, you know, they're, they're, it's a little tighter there. Want to really know what the people are using the cash outs for. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, man, I mean, you're right. It, it's it, it's definitely a, a seller's market we're in. Are you ready to automate and explode your real estate investing? We're searching for extremely motivated individuals who are sick and tired of wasting time and want to finally see real results from their real estate investing business. We're searching for investors looking to get to the next level and become a bigger, better version of themselves while being a more successful real estate investing entrepreneur. Apply for mentoring and coaching at joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. That's joshcantwellcoaching.com forward slash podcast. No doubt. And the things that are different, obviously, 10, 12 years later, since 2008, you know, I look at the stated income, the Nina loans, no income, no asset, no down payment, no job. You know, those loans don't <laughs> exist. Those, yeah. those, Thank God. Those loans don't exist anymore. So that it's removed from the market. So it, a, a big portion of the previous bubble was built off of that. Second thing is that they were able to package those loans up into mortgage-backed securities and those were triple A rated by Standards and Poor's, you know, triple A rated by the rating agencies. The rating agencies have essentially learned their lesson, right? And now they're more proactively rating things and looking at the portfolios. So you just don't see because look, if you're a if you're a mortgage lender, whether it's on Q, whether it's Quicken, whether it's, you know, Bank of America, they eventually sell those securities to Fannie and Freddie. Those yeah. Fannie and Freddie securities become mortgage backed securities and they have to be rated to turn them into some sort of bond product that right. can be sold to the end market, which is coming right back to institutional and retail investors yep. who are investing in those portfolios. Without the rating, without the Standard & Poor rating or the Moody's rating or the Fitch mm -hmm. rating, without the rating, you can't sell the product in the end market. So I think those two things give me a lot more confidence that this market is not fake. Whereas in 2007, yes. 2008, it's like, oh man, it's, it's pretty fake right now, and I yeah. think we've learned our lesson there. So um, tell me a little bit more about debt-to-income ratios. Recently, the CFPB came out with um, some new legislation of potentially removing debt-to-income ratios or potentially increasing debt-to-income ratios, which was really pushed hard by Bank of America and Quicken Loans. What's going on with debt-to-income ratios? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, you know, again, in the next year, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, being licensed only a full state, if, uh, you know, probably a handful of states, 13 states. I got to kind of be careful with what numbers I'm, I'm preaching to, but, uh, sure. but absolutely, you know, with the CFPB and, and everybody's pushing for higher debt to income ratios. And that was primarily um, on the gubby back products. Right. Um, and, and that's great. Right. Really. We want to get, you know, those first time home buyers, the FHA, the Fannie Freddie backed, um, you know, loans, so to speak, you know, it, we want, we want to increase on those. Typically, you know, you're looking at 43, 49%, depending on the product anywhere in there. Um, and, uh, and that obviously provides, you know, more liquidity in the market, more buying fever, uh, which I think everybody has right now. I think that, uh, I think you'll, you'll see, you, you, again, you're going to see it same about the same as it is today over the next 12 months, right? I, I think anytime you're in, you know, a, around an election, everybody's a little cautious, sure, uh, of, of course, that. of course. But um, I, I really think we're, I, I think we've got another 48 months probably left, uh, left of, of, you know, high appreciation. And then I don't think we're going to see the dip we saw. I think a lot of these things like that increase by the CFPB, um, you know, are, are going to really 
uh, are and, 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 and people leaving higher markets, like you said, New York, California, they don't want to pay those taxes anymore. You know, we're, we're fortunate enough in Arizona, we have an influx of buyers, you know, huge right. commerce going on here. Um, so I, I think, I think you're going to see it, you know, probably a little bit of relief there. And, uh, you know, they, they want to make homeowners of people. They're, they're not afraid of uh, the values dropping at this time. And, but in the same respect, you don't want people to end up underwater, right? Because yeah. that's when that's when they'll walk away from the house, right? That's so. I think they are going to be cautious of that. Got it, Christian. How about for investors? Uh, you obviously, as a retail lender, you can still work with investors who are building portfolios, make you know a certain number of loans. Help me understand what is some advice. Um, and some guidance that you give to retail investors who are buying and building rental portfolios using the buy, rehab, rent, and then refi, right? Refinancing maybe out of private money or refinancing out of cash that they use to buy the property and acquire it. Um, what kind of things are you helping them do to get them set up to get their financing, to make sure that they're structured properly to get their financing, they have enough liquidity to get their financing? Mm -hmm. um, are there certain things that you want them to have in advance so that they know when they buy the property that they can successfully refi and they don't get declined for their long-term loans? Yeah. So a couple of things, and I'll kind of cover you some of the issues we see in the marketplace first is when you're buying that first investment home, third investment home, ninth investment home, whatever it is, if you're using hard money or you're not using, you know, a retail lender, which a lot of people aren't on that first home, right? They, they need, they need a program without, you know, without some guidelines, they need a little bit more flexible program, right? Properties right? need and repairs. They need money for rehab. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So you want to make sure that you borrow the correct amount of money, right? First, we have a lot of people that come to us and they're three quarters of the way through the remodel, the rehab, um, and we can't loan on that property. We won't get an appraisal on that property. We won't be able to cash them out of that. At that point, they're at a point they've got another, they've got to go out and find another hard money lender to cure that first loan and, and you know, obviously, you know, finish that, uh, that rehab. And when you're paying, you know, 10, 12%, depending on what market you're in, probably 15, 18% uh, on the money, you're held up for a few months, you're eating up your profit. So make sure you borrow right the first time. Um, you've got a good contract, you've got a good estimate on those. Another thing that we do is we really walk them through the process, right? So we really view the property. We look at comps with them in the area. We say, okay, what's this property going to be worth at the end? At the end, are you going to want to pull cash out of this property? Are we going to be rolling that cash out into another property? What are your long-term goals with this? Um, rates are so phenomenal right now. If you're an investor, you ought to look at that 15-year rate, right? Just think, if this is something you want to buy and hold, let's, let's, let's try and get you into a 15-year. That home's going to be paid for in 15 years right. and full cash flow. Everything coming out of that minus repairs, obviously, will be cash flow. Um, you want to make sure that uh, you know, you, you've got the, the adequate amount of reserves, right, on an investor property. Um, depending on the program, you know, it can range. But I, I would say holding a year's worth of reserves, mortgage reserves, is, is a good uh, is, is a good you know, safety net, right? Right. Um, so we, we kind of got to look at the picture, look at what the goals are. If it's a fix and flip property, we look at it totally different, right? Um, we actually have people coming to us now, uh, quite interestingly enough, that, that have bought properties for hotels and they assembled three residential properties. I was just doing a deal uh, in Portland on one of these. They assembled three residential properties, got a commercial loan on it the first time. Well, the, now they came and all those properties are still rented. The property is taking much longer for them to get permits. Uh, everybody's backed up issuing permits, right? They're going to be hotel and multifamilies on those. Um, so they came to us. They said, hey, we want you guys to, uh, to refi these for us on residential properties. It makes way more sense with rates being at where they're at. Um, so there, there's a lot of unique things that we're able to do. I mean, I think in the past, somebody never thought, hey, we'd move from a commercial to a residential loan. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you got to look at all your kind of resources, right? Um, and, and see what makes sense for, for, the, uh, for the property. Yeah, I agree. I love your your uh, comment about the 15-year mortgage. I talk to my audience and our students often about that because it's really I call it the every man's the every man's way to millions, right? Because yep. if you bought a property today and let's say you bought it and you're all into it for 75 70 75% of its value and you're able to put a tenant in there and refinance it using long-term financing and using 15-year note um, 15 years from now, that property is completely paid off. Well, let's say you bought a property today and then 15 years from now, that one's paid off. And then you buy a property next year, just one, 
Well, 16 years from now, that property's paid off. And then in the third year, another one. And then in the 17th year, that property is paid off. And then as you get into buying one property each year for the next 15 years in a row, all on 15 year amortization schedules, 15 years from now, that first one is paid off, debt free and cash flowing with tons of equity, tons of profit, no mortgage and some appreciation. You know, yeah. Then in year 16, you got another one. So if you wanted to at that time, you could refi and pull cash out and live on the cash and it's tax free. Or yeah. you could just live off the cash flow that it's generating and you have you've built your your balance sheet. So there's really no excuse. You know, Christian, you deal with a lot of investors and people come up with all different kinds of excuses. I want to buy a rental property. I want to build a portfolio. I need more retirement income. I need more cash flow. Well, I've never seen a better time than now to buy a property and rent it out and then refinance it long term. Now is the perfect opportunity to build that uh, retirement nest egg. So I'm sure you, you work with a lot of investors trying to accomplish that. Yeah. And one of the other things I'd like to add that's so great about the 15-year loan, and, and I know most investors, they don't start looking at amortization schedules and everything. But the one thing to remember is when you buy a home, let's say on a 30-year loan, right? You actually look at the amortization schedule, right? You're from day one, you're paying far more interest than you are on principal. So you made an interesting comment a moment ago, right? Where you said, you know, you have much more equity in the home. So let's take that 30 year mortgage, right? From day one, let's say the mortgage is $1,000, right? Probably 850 is going to interest and, right. and, and, you know, the other 150 is going to equity. It's a complete flip flop. If you look at a 15 year amortization schedule, that same thousand dollar loan, probably, and again, I'm just ballparking numbers. I don't have a calculator in front of me, but probably five or 600 of it, maybe even 700 is, is going to principal right off the bat. And the other part is going to the interest. So essentially the way, and I always like to say this, you know, 30 year mortgage, you're kind of renting your home from the bank. Yeah. You're going to have the upside of the appreciation. Uh, 15-year mortgage, you've got a renter in that home, that renter is literally building your equity for you. What? I mean, yeah. What's better than that? That's fantastic. In my newest real estate investing book, The Flip System, you'll learn the proven secrets and strategies that I've used to be a successful real estate investor. You'll also hear the story of my journey from quitting my job to doing over 2,000 units of apartments. The Flip System is now available for a limited time, and you can grab your free copy at getflipsystem.com slash podcast. You'll learn the same proven principles and secrets and investing strategies that I used to quit my job and pursue a life of financial freedom. In this book, I'm sharing exactly how I was able to personally close over 750 profitable real estate deals, make over 400 private lender loans, raise over $30 million, and acquire over 2,000 units of cash flowing apartments. Get my newest book now for free at getflipsystem.com slash podcast. That's getflipsystem.com slash podcast. Christian, I know you guys work with technology a lot and, you know, helping people understand markets, evaluate markets, use technology to their advantage for lead generation, understanding markets, understanding residential investing. How are you successfully seeing your clients use technology to get a competitive advantage? Because we know it is very competitive out there right now. Yeah, they're using it numerous ways. One of the coolest ways that I've seen is, it, you know, if you Googled real estate purchase software or real estate software, right? There's a bunch of companies that have come to market that have, it's basically software that will run an algorithm around the address that you're looking for, around the neighborhood that you're looking for, and really guide you in that purchase. Now, most of these software companies were multifamily, you know, purchase uh, software companies before, right? But they've they've come to to, to market with software and buyer programs that are meant for the smaller investor, one unit, three units, you know, five home investor, right? And I had a young guy that absolutely killed it, picked up $100,000 in equity in a neighborhood in Phoenix that I would not have touched. Um, 
And, uh, and, and, he, and he said, he's like, man, I owe it all to this software. So I don't have one that I can obviously recommend, but that technology and those algorithms are, are the tools that, that big banks have, private equity have, multifamily investors like yourself probably used before, right? That are now available to the smaller investor. Take advantage of it for 40, 60, 80, dollars a month, whatever, whatever they're charging for. That's probably the biggest untapped tool that I've seen out there, right? Um, You know, now for the home shopper, you know, you gotta be using some sort of CRM, right? Building your database. If you're an investor out there looking to purchase residential homes or duplexes, fourplexes, start to use, uh, obviously, and I think everybody's almost using a CRM at this point, but use those drip campaigns, use text messaging through it, right? Not only do you have a record of everything, but drip drip on all the people uh, that you've spoken to regarding if you're out there door knocking, Enter them, enter them in the CRM when you leave. Hey, is it okay if I drop you a text message every, uh, you know, once a month just to remind you I'm here, right? After a six, eight, 12 month period, you've stayed in front of that person through those automated drips, right? If you're just running a list next to your desk or, uh, or, or a CRM without using that automation, you're, you're kind of shorting yourself, right? You'll, you'll start yeah. to see properties trickle in and you may even find yourself in a wholesale position. Somebody may reach out to you and, you know, you may, may not be the right time, but you may be, able to, may be able to agree to a price and through, through your investor podcast, you may be able to say, Hey guys, I've got a home up for sale and pick up a 10, quick 10, 20 grand. I mean, really make that automation work for you. No doubt. No doubt. We're a big believer in software. I founded a software program years and years ago. Um, it's called accelerated investor office, AI office. Okay. And, uh, it does all the things you're talking about. Build websites, text messaging, automated voicemails, automated direct mail, yep. uh, you know, professional packets, CRM solution, drip campaigns. Um, it's great to hear you say that. And for those people that are interested in that, check out acceleratedinvestoroffice.com. We'll put it in the show notes as well. Um, so Christian, as we round third and head for home, a lot of our audience is entrepreneurs. They're real estate entrepreneurs, obviously, but they're entrepreneurs of all kinds. We've got guys who own e-commerce businesses that own, uh, that are in sales and they invest in real estate on the side. Um, so as you've built your business of lending and, you know, gone through your entrepreneurial journey, uh, what are some just tips, some of some strategies that kind of keep it all together? Some, some hacks, if you will, that just have allowed you to become successful in your own right as a lender and as an entrepreneur, whether it's, you know, different ways that you manage your schedule, time management, we're all struggling with so many different obligations Mm -hmm. and requirements of our time. Um, What are some things that you've done to continue to kind of keep sane and be successful at the same time? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is is anytime being an entrepreneur, um, and especially in, uh, in entrepreneur in real estate, is you've got to keep your emotions in check. And this is a thing that's uh, something I don't hear many other people talk about. You're out there seeing an open house and there's, you know, seven other people going through it at the time. And you can very easily get caught up in your emotions. Oh my God, this is going to be the best Airbnb property ever. I'm going to be netting, you know, 10k a month off this property and you get caught up in that next thing you know you're in a bidding war you're emotional about the property and even on the flip side right you walk up to a house doesn't have much curb appeal you think oh this place is junk right now take a step back look at the numbers look at your cost basis don't get emotional about the property right what i would say is too is apply that um to to entrepreneurialism in, in in general right it's going to be bumpy. You know, don't, don't let the emotions take you up and take you down. Yeah. As far as strategies that I use, um, I, every night I, I take a moment before I go to bed. One, I don't want to make up in the middle of the night and wonder what my day is going to look like. I plan my day out. Now, obviously, you know, we, we, we can't plan for everything that's going to happen in our day, but I lay it out, whether that means up at, up at 4.30 to the gym at 5, you know, morning meetings. I lay it out. I also lay out my to-do list, what I need to get accomplished, prioritize that the next day, make sure that as I'm working through my day that, uh, that, that those things are, are, are top of mind, right? And as I'm wrapping up my day, I'm assessing how, how I've done productivity-wise. Productivity is, is escalated like never before. I mean, you know, through, through cell phones, through emails, through self emails on our cell phones, technology, um, we're never really away from the workplace anymore. Right, you? right. So you also got to find a piece of time. For me, that's the gym in the morning. I'm not a gym rat, not a big buff guy, but, but that's 
45 minutes to an hour where I'm not with my cell phone. My cell phone's in my locker. I've cleared my head and I'm able to do that because I've already set my day up the night before. I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm basically coming to battle with, with the right weapons That's at, right. at that point. I love you know? it. I love it. It's important, Christian, because I've, I've been preaching to our audience for years that Sunday nights for me is the most important day or time, mm-hmm. uh, just one hour, two hours on Sunday nights, because when I post and prioritize on Sunday night, I go through all my priorities. I kind of just do a big brain dump of all the things that I want to get done, both in my personal life, my professional life, my family, relationships, financing. Mm-hmm. You know, working with my family, just different things. When I usually, when I get all that down, get it all on paper, then put it into my calendar, I know what my priorities are, and I schedule things out Monday through Friday or Monday through Saturday the following week. I usually sleep really good on Sunday nights. Some people dread getting up on Monday morning. For me, like I, I'm excited to get up and get to the gym or excited to get the volleyball practice on Monday nights. I can start my day early and cut out early so I can go coach my kids, which I love to do it in, uh, with our club volleyball program. But it all starts with Sunday night. It all starts with posting and prior to So I love to hear you say, remove the emotion from real estate. Remove the emotion mm-hmm. from your entrepreneurial journey and understand you're going to have really high highs, really low lows. You got to chop off the high highs, chop off the low lows and stay in the middle Especially if you're a leader, especially if you're a CEO or yeah. you're leading other people, you have a sales team, because the more emotional you are, the more of a wreck it can be for all of them because it filters all the way down to everybody else. And then the second thing about posting and prioritizing is huge because I don't know how people can possibly get up, Christian, I don't know about you, but I don't know how I can get up and get started with your day and have no clue what I'm about to do. <laughs> like I've got to know the night before or the Sunday before what's going on and what's important. When I show up without a plan, it can take me hours to really get in my groove. Like I, it yeah. all could be all of a sudden it's 11 o'clock and I'm like, what the hell have I been doing all morning versus when I post and prioritize the night before or the Sunday prior and I've got everything laid out, like I'm ready to roll, drop my kids off at school, 730 in the morning, I'm at the office and I'm rocking versus the opposite when I'm not uh, prioritized up and I haven't posted all my goals or posted all my to do's. I could be a mess until like after yeah. lunch and I'm still not sure. Then I get pissed off at myself because my whole day went to shit. You know how it is, man. That the only difference is the posting and prioritizing and removing the emotion. So great, great advice there. I appreciate that a lot. So, Absolutely. So Christian, um, as we kind of ran, wrap up here, I know there's going to be some of our listeners that want to do business with you, that want to reach out to you, whether it's on social sure. media, whether it's borrowing from you guys um, at OnQ Financial, reaching out to you to joint venture on deals or get funding for their properties and their portfolio. What's a great place for them to connect with you? You know, I mean, LinkedIn, it's J Christian Olin, uh, obviously Christian dot Olin, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N dot Olin, O-L-I-N, at onq, O-N-Q, financial.com uh, is my email. My direct number is 480-320-3095. That rings any and all devices I have. So uh, any of those three methods, I mean, please don't, uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to reach out, even if it's just with some simple questions. Fantastic, Christian. Thanks so much for joining us today on Accelerated Investor. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. You've been listening to Josh Cantwell and the Accelerated Investor Podcast. Leave a comment on our iTunes channel and let us know what you want to learn next or who you'd like Josh to interview. While you're there, give us a five-star rating and make sure to subscribe so you can be the first to hear new episodes. Follow Josh Cantwell and his companies, Strategic Real Estate Coach and Freeland Ventures on all social media platforms now and stay up to date on new training and investment opportunities to start your journey toward the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. Apply for coaching at joshcantwellcoaching.com.